Welcome to the May 2019 Mike, the monthly implementation call for the Speak and Prosper Academy. This is Craig Valentine, and this call today is on five common and I would say costly mistakes that speakers make with their stories. You're going to pick up some ideas that you may never have heard before, and I think they'll lead you to get some results that you may never have had before. So you know me, no fluff, just practical stuff. We're going to dive right in. And we're going to start with mistake number one. And let me make sure I'm not making a mistake because one time I did about 30 seconds of a call and had myself muted. But it looks like I'm okay now. All right. So let's go into to mistake number one. And I'm going to get you involved. I want you to tell me some of the answers of the questions that I have. All right. Number one is, and again, this is for stories. Speakers don't get to the dialogue quick enough. They don't get to the dialogue of their story quick enough. Now, if you've heard me teach before, I teach a lot about getting to the conflict quickly because when you, the earlier you get to the conflict, the earlier you have your audience hooked in. Conflict is the hook, right? Because everybody wants to know how you're going to overcome that conflict. But if conflict is the hook to the story, dialogue is the heart of the story. What one character says to the other or what one character says to himself that's what pumps life into the story. Now, dialogue is what you would put – if you were writing it, you would put it in quotation marks. We need to get to that early on. I was in a few places recently, and I was watching some speeches, and people were just – they were narrating. And the more you narrate, the more it sounds like a report. When you use dialogue, it sounds like a story. So always remember this. Narration is retelling the story. Dialogue is reliving it. Narration is telling it in the past. Dialogue is living it in the present. Because if you really think about dialogue, your audience gets to hear it exactly how you heard it. And that brings immediacy. That brings presence, uh, a present moment to the story. It puts your audience members right there in the scene. So here, here's an example of a story that I tell, and I want you to figure out what my first line of dialogue is. And this can be tricky, so I want you to listen closely. I'm going to actually do this live right here on the call, which I don't normally do. I'll, I'll play some audios for you in a little bit, but let's do it live right here on the call, okay? Ready? Okay, 1997, I'm flying back from Los Angeles to Baltimore. It's a five-hour flight. I sit down on the flight. Guy sits down next to me, and I remember thinking, hmm, this guy looks kind of like me, just a slightly older version. I wonder what he does in life. Now, if you fly a lot, you'll appreciate this. The first four and a half hours of the flight, we say absolutely nothing to each other. The last half hour of the flight, he turns to me and he says, how you doing? I said, I'm fine. You know, I've actually been here the whole time. He said, I'm sorry I didn't talk to you earlier, but I didn't want to talk to you and then find out you were boring and then be stuck talking to a boring person for five hours. You understand. Okay, now let's just stop right there. I want you to hit star two. If you want to raise your hand and answer this question, but what was the first line of dialogue? All right. I got a hand up already. I figured it might be you, Dwight, because I think you understand this pretty well. <laughs> but what, what do you think was the first line of dialogue there? Well, the, 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 the guess I'm going to do is that you've taught us that dialogue is between two people. That's one level. But dialogue is also – when we uh, what we're thinking in our mind. So mm -hmm. when you said, "Hmm, I wonder what he does," was dialogue within yourself. So I think that might have been the first line. Of ding, dialogue. ding, 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 ding. You got it. You got it. I didn't know if anybody would get that, but that's exactly right. You might have thought, "Well, he didn't. Craig didn't get to dialogue until he he had the the, the gentleman talking to him." No, the dialogue came in what Dwight is describing as inner dialogue. Okay, it's not when the guy said, how you doing? It's when I said, hmm, this guy looks kind of like me, just a slightly older version. I wonder what he does in life. See, that's inner dialogue. That's the dialogue that's going on inside of my mind while that story is going on. And we need to use that. We need to use it way more than we have been using it because not only does, di does that dialogue pump life into the story, but it brings you inside of my own mind. You get to hear what I was thinking at that very moment, and then maybe you could be thinking something similar. So I, I'm, I'm going to say this. If you've spoken – if your story started 
and you've gone 45 seconds without dialogue, you're going to lose your audience. Let me just be blunt. If you've gone 45 seconds in your story and you haven't used any dialogue yet, chances are you're going to lose your audience. Anytime I'm coaching a speaker on stage in front of other people, I, I, afterwards I'll say to the audience, when did that story really take off? And the audience will almost always say, when so-and-so said this to so-and-so. So it's dialogue that's going to pump life into that story. Thank you, Dwight. I appreciate that. That was a great answer. Let me see. This is somebody from South Carolina also who had a response. Who's this in South Carolina? This is Angela Tennyson. Hi, Angela. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing well. Well, Did you have the same answer as Dwight or did you have a different answer? I had the same answer. I was just a dialogue with yourself. Well, of course you have the same answer. Now you know you're right. But yeah, no, 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 I wrote it down. I, wrote it down. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, it was it was the inner dialogue. Do you use some of that in your stories? I I do, um, because that's I think it's like you said the life, but I think bringing people into my head is is really important. Yeah. To really make the story pop or or be memorable. Right. Good. I'm I'm glad you do because. What a lot of people do, sometimes people do it, but they do it the wrong way. You know, they, they'll, they'll bring the audience in their mind, but they'll do it in a way that's narrated. Like they would say something like, and as I sat there, I was wondering what he did for a living. Well, that, that's not the same. You know, that's not the same. That's not bringing us in. That's, again, that's retelling it. That's narrating it. And, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later as we get to another story. But, yes, it's about dialogue, whether it's inner dialogue, whether it is character-to-character dialogue. If you've heard me teach before, well, you're in the academy, so you can go look at projected dialogue that I talk about a lot in the humor course. And there's audience dialogue. There's actual audience. There are so many different types of dialogue that we can bring into our stories. Look at the Mike 2017 March call. And you'll see five different do's and don'ts with dialogue. That goes back two years. But look at that. Go back in the academy and look at that call. All right, so that's number one is they they don't get to the dialogue quickly enough. Again, get there at least within the four, first 45 seconds. Let's look at mistake number two. They don't use the spaces and faces between the lines. And I'm talking about the lines of dialogue, but I'm just talking also about the lines in, in your speech that you've written if you write them. It's one of the biggest mistakes is rushing from one line of dialogue to the other. And because it's really what happens in between the lines that make the lines work. Remember this. Think about this. In real life, when somebody says something to you, don't you need to take a moment to digest what, you, what they've said before you respond? That takes a moment, doesn't it? Well, we need to reflect that in our stories on stage. So, for example, you're, you're about to listen to a, a, just two minutes of a quick story that I tell, and I want you to listen to – well, I don't make the mistake in this story, but you'll see how I take advantage of the spaces between the lines. So let me get to that, set it up. And again, this is just about two minutes of this story. Here we go. And I walked in, I saw a table, and behind the table was a lady who looked like she could be my assistant. So I went up to her, and this is about 12 years ago. I went up to her, and I said, hi, I'm Craig Valentine. I'm the trainer today. I kid you not, this is exactly what she did. Oh, good to... She said, you're the trainer? I said, yes, yes, I'm the trainer. She said, oh, oh, my gosh. They're going to be shocked. You ever know the answer, but you want to ask the question anyway? <laughs> so I said, well, tell me, why, why are they going to be shocked? She said, because you don't look like the regular trainers. I said, I know I'm tall. <laughs> she said, no, I don't know how to tell you this. You're black. <laughs> I'll tell you what. 
five minutes after I start my workshop, I want you to duck your head in there and see how shocked they look. She said, okay, but I'm telling you, they're going to be shocked. Five minutes later, I start my, or a little bit later, I start my workshop. Five minutes after I start, she ducks her head in there. During my first break, she runs up and attacks me in the hallway. She said, oh my gosh, they were listening to you. You actually had them. They were listening to you. And then she looked at me as if to say, and you're still black. <laughs> See, what she didn't realize is when I went through Johns Hopkins University and got my MBA. All right, let's just stop it right there. So take your time. Milk the moment. Did you hear how many laughs I got that happened in between the lines? You know, when I when I said I'm the trainer today and she looked at me as if to say, uh, uh, it's nice to, you know, and I do more of that now. I, I play it up even more. So it's interesting going back and listening to the way it used to be because now there's even more that I do in between the lines in that story. So I want you to think what can you do in between the lines and think of what your reaction would be before you verbalize it. And that's going to give you internally, that's going to give you the best and the correct timing. So write this down. Show it before you say it. Show it before you say it. When one character says something to you, then you should show your response before you say it because it's going to hit your face before it hits you verbally. Right? The other thing that's very important to understand is – and this is, oh, this is so important – characters can't react to narration. You can't react to narration. It wouldn't make sense. If I narrate it and I, and I said, and she told me I was black, and then I make a face, like, what? No. But when she says, you're black, oh, then, then I can react to that. Okay? You can't react to, to narration. You can only react to dialogue. So when she said, you're black, I looked at myself as if to say, I am? What? And now I do even more in between the lines. And even in that part, part I think I did a little cabbage patch dance before I went to the next line of dialogue. But there are probably at least eight seconds between the lines of dialogue, and, and that's where the story lives. That's where the story lives. So what can you do in between your lines? When she runs over to me and attacks me in the hallway, nowadays on stage, I'm literally running. I'm literally running. And then when she gets to me, I stop, and then I pause. Nowadays, I do it a little bit more like this. And she, and she attacked me in the hallway, and she ran up to me, and she said, okay, and then I pause, and she said, they were actually listening to you. They had, you had them in the palm of your hand. They were listening to you. They were, li they were listening to you. And then she looked at me as if to say, and then I look, her, I look me up and down, and you're still black. Right? And it just all of that stuff that happens in between the lines is what's drawing the audience in. I can feel it, and you'll be able to feel it as well. So what can you do in between your lines to make it not just a story but more of an experience? What can you do physically in between the lines? What can you do with your facial expressions? So share, show your character's thought before you verbalize it. There's a lot of space in that story and really in most stories to, to show it before you say it. Let, I'm going to get you involved here as well. Let's go to number three because number two was they don't use the spaces and faces between the lines. Number one was they don't get to the dialogue quick enough. One of the third mistakes is they pre-ramble. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean you don't even get to the story quick enough. Don't pre-ramble. Get to the story as fast as you can with the least amount of setup possible. Let's go into the, 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 the fourth one. Now, again, the third one was they pre-ramble. The second one was they don't use the spaces and faces between the lines, especially between the lines of dialogue. And the first mistake was they don't get to the dialogue quick enough. But the fourth mistake, oh, and I see speakers make it all the time, and I've made it, and I'm still making it with one of my stories, which I'm using, I'm trying to correct now. But they don't condense to connect. Let me say that again. They don't condense to connect. In storytelling, you shouldn't tell them everything. You just have to tell them the main thing. I really feel like stories get better when you use what I call addition by subtraction, meaning they get better not by what you add, but by what you remove, by what you take out. Think of it almost like a ship that's anchored. 
And when you take something out, it's almost like lifting up the anchor so that the ship can sail, so that your story can go. And so it's very important to condense to connect. Now, what do you condense? There are several things that you can condense. But before we look at which things you can condense, I want you to hear my signature story. Again, you've heard this story probably before. You may have seen it before as well from me online. But I want you to listen to it, and then we're going to go back and actually take you to the story behind the story so you can see how I've condensed it, where I've condensed it, and how I've removed the boring parts. Okay, so let's get to my signature story, and we'll get back. And, and even if you heard it before, you're going to get some learnings from it that you probably haven't picked up before. So here we go. And I went up to him. I said, look, John, I'm going to be leaving because it's always been my dream to be a full-time professional speaker. He said, that's your dream, Craig? I said, yes, it is. He said, well, that's great. I really admire you for having one, but you can't leave. I said, hold on now. What do you mean I can't leave? He said, well, Craig, we've been thinking about it, and we're going to raise your salary up to this. Salary means the same thing in Florida, right? (laughs) I said, look, this is not a financial decision. If anything, this is about my dream. I call this a dream decision. He said, okay, I understand. I really do. But how about if we raise your salary up to this? I said, this is not a financial decision. This is a dream. Do you know he raised it four times? I kid you not. He kept saying, we're going to raise your salary up to this. I said, this is not a financial decision. This is a dream decision. He said, okay, Craig, how about if we raise your salary to well above six figures? I said, dreams are overrated. (laughs) Come on now, six figures. Back then, that was a lot of, that's good money today. Shoot, I'd fill up my gas tank for a week on that kind of stuff. (laughs) I said, but John, before I say yes to you, I've got to go home and talk to my wife about this. So I went home to my wife. I said, honey, I don't know what to do. What what do you think I should do? What should I do? And my wife looked up at me with her big brown eyes and said, take the money, fool. (laughs) You like my wife, don't you? (laughs) But if you had been sitting beside my wife and me just a few moments later on our old beat-up black leather sofa, with the chocolate chip cookies baking in the background. You would have heard her say something that can absolutely change your life, and I know because it changed mine. She said, Craig, this is all you've ever talked about. Ever since we met, this is all you've ever wanted. I don't care how much they try to compensate you. Your dream is not for sale. All right, let, let's stop right there. Where did I condense that story? Well, let me, let me tell you. Basically, I went back, and if you don't know the end of that story, I went back and I said to the vice president, my wife said my dream is not for sale, <laughs> and I left. And that very year, I spoke over 160 times in 44 states and five countries, <clears throat> and I'm happy to say I've been running my mouth ever since. Okay, but there's nothing special about me. There's something very special about the advice my wife gave me. No matter how good you are at what you do, don't let that good get in the way of the best. And no matter where you are in your life at this very moment, remember the words of my wife. Your dream is not for sale. Okay? So tell a story, make a point. The point of that story was your dream is not for sale. But here's something that you probably don't know about that story. It actually happened over a four-day period. Four days. And I I took the four days and put them into one conversation because what was happening was I, I would go to the vice president. He would offer me a raise. I would go home. I would think it over. I talked to my wife. I talked to a whole, lot, a whole lot of other people, and I'll come back the next day, and I would say, no, I'm still leaving, and he would offer me more money, and I would go home, and I would talk about it, and I would come back, and I would say I'm still leaving. He would offer me more, but if I did it that way, then over a four-day period, that gets boring. Okay, I know Les Brown has his great radio station story, and he, he finds a way to work that and make it happen, but here I don't think it would work. I, I, I didn't want to do it, so what I did was I condensed time. Now, everything about that story is still true. I just condensed time, and I took what happened over a four-day period, and I put it into one conversation with this vice president. The essential truth of the story is still there. It's still the same. I just took out the boring parts, so I condensed it to connect with my audience. I don't think I would connect as much if I kept coming back the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day, and doing all that. So I just condensed 
time. So put all four days into one conversation. So that's one thing you can do is you can condense the time instead of spreading it out so much. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think my wife had anything else to say to me during that decision? Of course she did. We talked for hours over those four days. But what I did was I took everything she said and I boiled it down to the most important statement I heard her say, which was, your dream is not for sale. So I condensed dialogue. That's right. I condensed dialogue. And this is something that speakers need to do because, of course, I'm a big advocate of dialogue, but you can't tell everything. You can't say everything that the, the other character said and everything that you said back and everything they said back to you and everything you said back to them and everything you said to yourself. You can't, you can't do it all. Like I, I really kind of firmly believe that if you have two back and forths of, of lines of dialogue with the other character, if you go for a third or fourth back and forth without breaking it up in some way or asking the audience a question in some way, then your audience is going to start to, to feel lost. They're going to be like, okay, enough already. So find a way to condense it and say the most important things rather than just saying everything, All right? So I condensed time. I condensed dialogue. What else did I condense? Well, do you think anybody else other than my wife had advice for me? Oh, man, I had speakers that had advice for me. I had coworkers that had advice for me. They had offered me a position to, to manage some of the coworkers who, who had advice for me. Uh, they were like, no, don't manage me. Go ahead, go ahead and leave. But, I mean, what did I do? I took all of these people and I condensed them into one person represented by my wife. Now, hit star two if you have any idea of why I didn't talk about more of the group and why I condensed them into just being my wife who represented the group. Hit star two if you have any thoughts on why I didn't talk more about the, you know, all these other people in the group rather than just my wife. Any thoughts? Feel free to hit star two if you have any thoughts on that. Okay, well, I'll tell you. It's because people don't relate to a group as much as they're going to relate to a person, to an individual. So that's why. They're not going to relate to a group as, not, as much as they're going to relate to my wife. They can't see a group. But when I describe my wife, they can see her and they can connect to her. So remember that your audience is going to connect with individuals more than they connect with a group. So. If you, if you have something where a group of people are giving you advice and they're kind of like the guru to your story, pick one person to represent that group. I think that's very important. So don't say it from everybody. Just say it from somebody. When reliving your story, feel free to condense time, condense dialogue, and condense the number of people. And make sure you do so without losing the essential truth of that story. Because okay, that's the, the fourth mistake that people make is they don't condense to connect. So you want to condense to connect. You want to make sure you don't pre-ramble. You want to make sure you use the spaces and faces between the lines of dialogue. And you want to make sure you get to the dialogue quickly enough. All right? Last but certainly not least, actually, I do have a bonus one for you too, but I, I'll give you this fifth one first. <clears throat> Speakers don't place their audience members somewhere inside of their scene. We want to find a place in our scene to physically place our audience members. And that's one of the strategies I use to make my audience feel like they're actually living the story with me. Put them somewhere in your scene. For example, here are a few lines from a few of my, my different stories. And I want you to ask yourself as I, as I give you these lines, as an audience member, where am I in Craig's story? So here's one. This comes from my uh, – well, I can't mention what the name of the story is. But for legal purposes, I can't mention the name of this restaurant, but its initials are K, F, and C. Now, imagine being in my passenger seat when this actually happened. I'm driving through the KFC. I get to the intercom. The lady says, welcome to KFC. How may I help you? Boom. Stop right there. Where are you in my story? You're in the passenger seat, Right? I said, imagine being in my passenger seat. So that's a wonderful way to bring people into your story just by saying, imagine, imagine being here. Imagine walking into the doctor's office with my wife and me. Imagine this. Imagine is a hypnotic stem word. So it's going to almost automatically help people get there. 
Help them be there with you. So that's one. Here, here's another one. If you had been walking towards me in the Chicago airport two days after I won the world championship, you would have seen my wife on one side of me and me carrying this gigantic crystal trophy, <laughs> just walking through the Chicago airport. And everybody's looking at me like, wow, who is that? Is that Denzel Washington? Okay, stop right there. Where are you? Where are you? You're walking towards me in the airport. All right? I, I put you right there for a reason. You're walking towards me in the Chicago airport, and that's where I want you. So find a way to put people somewhere in your scene. Let's go to the rule of three. Let's do another one. If you had picked up my phone in the year 2000, you would have heard a woman from the Michigan Consolidated Gas Company say to me, Craig, we want you to come out here and speak, and for 45 minutes, we're going to pay you $3,500. Stop. Where are you? You're in my kitchen on my phone, listening in on this conversation with me and the lady from the Michigan Consolidated Gas Company. So that's another type that you can use is, is if you had been there. If you had seen me, if you had walked towards me, if you had done this. But don't use the same one over and over again. Find different ways to put them somewhere in your scene. You might say, have you ever been in a damp, dark basement? Well, that's exactly where we were. Boom, there they are, in a damp, dark basement. Have you ever is another hypnotic stem that gets people thinking on a subconscious level. So find different, unique, creative ways to bring people into scenes that you've created. You get the picture? Find unique ways, all right? Because that way they can see what you saw. They can hear what you've heard. They can experience what you've experienced. In other words, you, you get them to relive it with you. And that's really what storytelling is all about. And the great Lou Heckler, he's a speaker, said, don't, don't, re, don't retell it, relive it. And I like to add on to that. Don't retell it, relive it, and invite them into your reliving room, right? Put them somewhere there. In the story you heard in the audio that I played most recently, you heard me say, if you had been sitting beside my wife and me just a few moments later on our old beat-up black leather sofa with the chocolate chip cookies baking in the background, you would have heard my wife, boom, where are you? You're actually sitting beside my wife and me on the sofa. Hearing what we heard, hearing what she says, and when she says your dream is not for sale, she's not saying it to me. She's saying it to you. That's the other secret to storytelling is when you have dialogue, that dialogue might feel like it's going from one character to the other, but it's actually going from one character to the audience as well because they get to hear it exactly how you heard it. They get to feel it exactly how you felt it. Okay, so find a way to put your audience members somewhere in your scene. That's number five. Number four, make sure you condense to connect. Number three, make sure you don't pre-ramble, but you get to the story quicker. Number two, make sure you use the spaces and faces between the lines. And number one, make sure you get to the dialogue quickly. So let me check in right here and now. You know that we never end with the Q&A, but let me check in and see if you have any questions or any comments before we go into the bonus lesson on how you can take your stories to another level by avoiding a certain mistake. So hit star two if you have any thoughts, any questions, any comments. I'm going to Virginia here. Who's this in Virginia? It's Leticia. Uh, did you call from another line? No, I got bumped off, so I had to call back. Ah, I saw that. I was, I was like, somebody's leaving at the best part. <laughs> All <No>. right, so, <laughs> so what what – What's your thought or comment or suggestion? Well, my question was, do you have multiple – do you put them in every scene because you've got the scene on the couch and you've got the scene in the office? So if, if you've got multiple scenes, you're, you're bringing them into all of them? Not necessarily. That's a great question. Not necessarily because then it can almost sound like a, a tool that I'm using, and you never want anything to sound like a technique. Like if I would said, okay, now if you had been in the office with my vice president – <laughs> you know, okay. now if you had been with yep. my wife and me, so no. But I want to at least put them in one scene. You know, if okay. I'm if and I'm is telling this a, a is this a pivotal scene or does it matter? Well, it, you know, in that case, it, in in that case, it's a pivotal scene, and I and usually for me, it is kind of like the pivotal scene. I guess I hadn't even thought about that, but that's usually where I do put them in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But either way, I I, I want to find a way. 
just some kind of creative way to put them in there. And, and I'm still searching for more creative ways. But, yes, usually it probably – if I go back and look at my stories, most likely it is in the pivotal scene where I put them. Great great insights and great questions. Thank you. Thank Love you. it. Okay, good. All right, if anybody else has a question, feel free to raise your hand by, by hitting star two. Otherwise, we will go into the bonus lesson, and this is a little bit more of something that I had to learn and I and I resisted it, to be honest, but let's go there anyway. People ask me all the time, they say, well, Craig, what is it that uh, – how, how do you find your stories? They say, you got all these great stories, but I, I don't really have that many interesting stories. Where can I find them? And I give them an answer that they don't want to hear, but this is the answer I'm going to give to you that, that I had to learn myself. Go to that part of your life you don't want to go to. Let me say it again. Go to that part of your life that you don't want to go to. There was an entire year of my life that I, I wanted to forget. I definitely didn't want to revisit it, and I certainly didn't want to share it with anybody. And I definitely didn't want to share it on stage to people because it was, it was filled with all these failures. It was the hardest part of my life. It was the transition from undergraduate school into the real world. That first year out, I had five jobs. I was failing everything. I had failing relationships. I had failing employment situations. I was failing everything. And I never wanted to share that with anybody. I just wanted to forget about that part of my life. And when I went to get coached by Patricia Fripp, I said, well, Fripp, I had all these jobs. I was failing. I had all these relationships. I was going from job to job because they kept getting, you know, I wasn't doing well in them. And she said, no, you weren't failing. You were exploring your options. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, that's an interesting way to look at it. But then when I sat back and looked at it, I, I thought, you know what? That was the most important part of my life because that was the part of my life that led me to become addicted to reading, to become addicted to books. And after I met with Patricia, I went in and dove into that part of my life and pulled out a story that I now use and many of my keynote speeches. And it's a story that makes people laugh and makes them cry, but it, it also entices them and encourages them to do one thing, and that's read. Read. Now, I even bring in the late, great Charlie Tremendous Jones, who says, you'll be the same person five years from now that you are today, except for two things, the people you meet and the books you read. And so I'm saying to you today, go to that part of your life that you don't want to go to, because that's where the gold is. That's where the emotions are. And if the emotions are there, guess what? You got a story. Because uh, that's what storytelling is. Story storytelling is bringing people into a, a scene. But guess what? You can't bring people into a scene that you're not emotionally in. So if if you can now now there might be some stories in there you're not ready to tell yet. But I still want you to consider going to some places in your life that you didn't want to go to. And as long as there's a redeeming, valuable lesson for people, like read, as long as there's a redeeming, valuable lesson for your audience, then consider telling that story. All right? So any questions before I close up? We have, the, for a recap, the mistakes were they don't get to the dialogue quick enough. They don't use the spaces and faces between the lines. They don't pre-ramble. I mean, they do pre-ramble. They don't condense to connect and they don't place their audience members somewhere inside of their scene. And as the bonus lesson, they don't go to that part of the life that they were hesitant to go to. So any questions or, or final thoughts before we wrap up, go ahead and hit star two. Any questions, thoughts? All right. So I'm going to wrap up just by saying this. When you're on stage, when it comes to stories, if you're not telling them for the right reasons, people can and will see through you. If you're a contestant in a speech and all you want to do is win the contest, people can and will see through you. If you're a professional speaker and all you want to do is get paid and get off stage, they can and will see through you. It's very important to be on stage for the right reason. And so as I close, I'll just say this. You may have heard me say this before. I've been helping some people with speech contests and so forth, but I remember back in the day when I was going in the speech contest, 
after I won at the club level and the area level, you had to win at the, the, the division level and the district level. And back then they had region levels. You had to change your speech. You had to, you had to have three speeches to win the contest back then, last millennium. <laughs> anyway, after I would win at the club level and the area level, there would always be somebody who would come up to me after my contest and they would say, great job. And I would get all these awards and rewards and so forth. But there would always be somebody who would say, hey, man, great job. You're going to win the next one? And I said, I, I don't know. I, I just want to touch lives. I just want to touch lives. And even way back in 99, that's what I always say. That's my, my theme was I just want to touch lives. But the interesting thing was every time I reached out my hand to touch a life, somebody put a trophy in it. But here's the key. I never reached for the trophy. I always reached for the life. So as you go on to your next stage and you tell your next story, I just have one question for you, and that's this. What are you reaching for? Thanks for joining me today on the May 2019 mic. We're going to pick up with these mics, and we're going to start taking them to another level. And if you have any thoughts on what kind of content you want me to cover for the next mic, feel free to, to email me at info at craigvalentine.com and let me know, and we'll put something together specifically to meet your needs in that area. Okay, thank you again, and again, I'll leave you with the question, what are you reaching for? Talk to you soon.